Welcome to the Healthy, Wealthy, and Smart Podcast. Each week, we interview the best and brightest in physical therapy, wellness, and entrepreneurship. We give you cutting-edge information you need to live your best life, healthy, wealthy, and smart. The information in this podcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be used as personalized medical advice. And now, here's your host, Dr. Karen Litzy. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. I am your host, Karen Litzy, and today's episode is brought to you by NetHealth. They want to help you maintain strong relationships with your patients, which is why they created the Redoc Patient Portal. Through this portal, you can use it for video conferencing for telehealth, secure messaging, shared, sharing documents and photos, and your patients have 24-7 secure on-demand access to their therapy health information without phone calls and voice messages. If you want to learn more about the Redoc Patient Portal, you can contact NetHealth at Redoc, that's R-E-D-O-C, at NetHealth.com. Now on to today's episode. I'm really excited to have Dr. Adam Culviner on the program. So he is a physiotherapist, leader of the Knee Injury and Osteoarthritis Research Group, and senior research fellow within the Latrobe Sport and Exercise Medicine Research Center in Melbourne, Australia. His research focuses on the outcomes of ACL ligament injuries, in particular the prevention and management of early knee osteoarthritis in young adults following ACL injury and reconstruction, which is what we are talking about today. His work has identified important clinical and biomechanical risk factors for post-traumatic osteoarthritis, and he is currently testing novel osteoarthritis prevention strategies in young adults following injury in a world first world clinical trial. He has published over 60 peer review articles in international journals, He has worked in teaching and research at universities in Australia, Norway, and Austria, and is a graduate of Harvard Medical School's Global Clinical Research Program. His research has been awarded American Journal of Sports Medicine Most Outstanding Paper in 2016, Australian Physiotherapy Association Best New Investigator in 2013 and 2016 in Musculoskeletal and Sports Research, and Sports Medicine Australia's Best Clinical Sports Medicine Paper in 2019. In this episode, yes, we are talking about outcomes following ACL injury, but we're really breaking it down to the short-term and the long-term burdens following ACL injury, why patient rapport is integral to effective treatment post-ACL injury, optimal loading strategy for non-surgical and post-surgical cases, and the latest research on prevention for early onset osteoarthritis. So I really want to thank Adam. You guys, this is a great episode. If uh, you are a clinician and you work with people with ACL injuries, this is really a must listen. And if you are someone who knows someone who has injured their ACL, you're going to want to tell them to take a listen as well. So thanks, everyone, and enjoy. Hey, Adam, welcome to the podcast. I'm so happy you're here, and I'm excited to talk about ACL injuries with you. So welcome. Thanks very much for having me, Karen. It's great to be here and chat. Yeah, so now uh, the bulk of your research is in uh, ACL injuries and not the mechanism of injuries for ACLs, but what happens after that injury? So before we get into, and we'll talk about the burden of ACLs and optimal treatment and osteoarthritis and why that happens, but what I would love to know is why are you interested in this subject matter? Sort of why did you make this kind of the centerpiece of your research? It's a good good question. So about 10 years ago or so now, I had um, done a couple of years of clinical practice as a physiotherapist in Melbourne where I'm based and um, was interested in pursuing a bit more of the the research line into ACLs because we had a we had a patient come to um, uh, one of myself and one of my colleagues who was a young guy about thirty five years old who'd had um, a very active healthy life up to that point he'd suffered an ACL injury about um, when he was twenty years old he was about thirty five now he'd got and he'd had a number of issues um, he'd got back to sport without any problems, but then now about, you know, 10 to 15 years later, he'd started having some pain, unable to do the things he normally would love to do, couldn't um, go back and play any more sport, couldn't start 
couldn't really play with his kids. He'd seen an orthopedic surgeon. He'd had an arthroscope, had a bit of a clean up. He'd now gone back to the surgeon and he was really in want of a knee replacement because he could no longer do the things that he wanted. And the, the surgeon basically said to him, You've, you're too young to have a knee replacement. Go and see Adam and Kay, my colleague, and um, see what we can do. And that really opened our eyes from a clinical perspective about um, these types of patients. And, and this particular young guy had um, on x-ray, most of his changes were actually in his patellofemoral joint, so in the patella and the trochlea. And that really set um, my mind up to go and look into the literature in this space and, and see what's out there in terms of not only osteoarthritis uh, in these young people, and clearly it was very burdensome for this young guy, but also why are we seeing this in the patellofemoral joint uh, in particular, and why is it causing so many problems? And so that really set us off um, for my PhD about 10 years ago, looking into these uh, medium to long-term outcomes to ultimately try and help these people uh, get back to do the things they want to do uh, without the pain and the symptoms that come with osteoarthritis a lot of the time. Yeah. Oh, great stories. And that's, that's a shame. 35 years old. Gosh, that's so young. Um, I, I can understand why that would really pique your interest because you don't want to see these patients coming into you. Or when you do see them, you want to be able to help them with the best evidence and best things that you can. So you had mentioned um, in this, in, in your uh, explanation there as to why this subject interests you, is that there is this sort of burden after having this ACL injury. So could you talk a little bit more about the burden of an ACL injury and subsequent surgery? Sure. So I'm sure it goes through a lot of people's mind as soon as they you know, hear that pop or click that if they know they've had an ACL injury, that's the initial burden is you know that worry of I can no longer play sport and Often if you do go and have a reconstruction surgery, it's often the nine, 10, 12 months um, of extensive rehabilitation as we know, and uh, not getting back to sport that often people find a lot of um, personal you know, satisfaction and get a lot of mental health benefit from playing sport and from their peer um, involvement and social interaction. So it's that initial burden of the extended period out of sport. Some people do really well with great rehab. They can get back to their sport they want to play at, back to the same level of performance. But there's a certain percentage, and about 50% of people uh, we know in the evidence will develop longer term, uh, not only persistent symptoms um, from a patient reported outcome perspective, but also um, ongoing functional limitations and ultimately the development of osteoarthritis, be that on radiographs, on x-rays, and some of our work is, which we can go into a little bit more detail in a moment, is, is looking at the earlier uh, changes on some more sensitive imaging like MRI um, to try and detect these types of people who might be more at risk of developing longer term changes. So, um, as I said, some people do really well following an ACL injury, be it rehab only or surgery, and we can chat about the differences in the, in the treatment options later as well. But about 50% of people uh, at the moment, and the evidence suggests that they will have um, osteoarthritis within about 10 years of their ACL injury. So if we think of the typical patient is the, you know, the adolescent or the young 20-year-old patient playing sport, they rupture their knee, only 10 years, 15 years down the track, they're still only 30, 35, exactly that, that young gentleman I spoke to earlier. Um, and they've got a knee of essentially that looks like on imaging of a knee of a typical 70 or 80-year-old. Um, and we know that imaging findings on x-ray don't necessarily match up particularly well with what we see clinically. So that's not necessarily you know, a sign that they're definitely going to have functional limitations and symptoms, but it certainly increases the risk of that happening and that, that burden at a time when people often have really important family commitments and young family commitments, um, work commitments, and they often still want to be active and participating in sport. And so when you bring all of those things in, to a knee that might not be, um, has re have recovered as well following an ACL injury, you might still have some muscle weakness if that wasn't um, addressed initially and, and create the picture of more of a persistent pain problem, then you start getting into being quite a burdensome condition uh, that we see these types of patients clinically come back in often five, 10 years following their injury. Yeah, and I can, I can imagine along with that persistent pain comes decreased activity, decreased movement. And we all know all of the sort of cascade of events that can happen 
when you're not getting in exercise, you're not getting in movement, you know, then you have risk of, of uh, obesity, risk of diabetes, uh, mental health issues. So all of that stuff can kind of stem from, you yeah. know, this, this burden of an ACL, which, you know, for a lot of people, I don't think that even would flash in their mind when you're looking at a 20 something year old who just tore their ACL because we know that and population it, yeah. who does tear are usually pretty athletic. Exactly. And that's the thing. Prior to their injury, they're often very healthy and, you know, never seen a doctor or never been to hospital before. And having the ACL injury can often be that initial, um, unfortunately, you know, the cascade where you become less physically active, you may not be able to give back to the sport you really want to, you start putting on weight and that increases the risk of all of these other conditions, as, as you've just said. And I think there's there was a recent article, um, a research paper actually showing that having an ACL injury increased your risk of a cardiovascular disease by about 50% longer term. So for me, that was a real, you know, wake up. <laughs> this knee is not just a knee. It's actually affecting the whole person. Um, mm -hmm. For the exact reasons you just mentioned that it can spiral into, you know, less physically activity, the pain, um, putting on weight, and then being the, the increased risk of all of the comorbid conditions as well. Exactly. And now let's say, so you mentioned uh, a couple of minutes ago about treatment. So you could have surgery, you cannot have surgery. So can you talk a little bit as to what the optimal treatment is after an ACL and how one comes to that decision, whether you're the clinician or you're the patient? How does that work? And that's the $64 question in this, <laughs> in this debate. So we sort of, yeah, you can have um, extreme of the spectrum. You can have one end, you can have everyone has surgery. The other end is no one has surgery. And the truth probably lies somewhere in the middle. So if we look to what the evidence suggests in the literature, there's very little um, high quality evidence comparing the two treatment options. There's really only one, what we call randomized controlled trial that's compared um, about 120 people who've had an acute ACL injury and they were either allocated to having early surgery, so within a couple of months of having the injury, and then a, an extensive rehabilita rehabilitation period over nine months or so. And then the other group, so exactly the same rehabilitation, the only thing is that they didn't have the surgery. And so the only difference between these two groups of patients was the surgery or not. Now, the group who didn't have the surgery initially could have the option of having surgery later on if they had ongoing problems or symptoms or, or desired to have the surgery later on, and they could cross over to the surgery arm. And what this study showed um, is initially, this is published back in 2010 now, so we've known this for over a decade, is that there's very little differences, both that two years after surgery, five years, and I think the, the authors are about to publish their 10-year outcomes, but certainly at the two and five year mark, there's very little differences whether you have surgery or not in terms of pain, symptoms, strength, return to sport, um, the need to have more surgery, quality of life, and indeed radiographic knee osteoarthritis. So I was fortunate enough um, during my time in Europe conducting a research fellowship recently to work with this group um, of researchers based in Sweden. And we looked at the MRI outcomes in this population. As I said earlier, trying to identify people maybe earlier in the process, um, initially after that ACL injury, to see if we can identify those more at risk of longer term problems, which might present opportunities to intervene a little bit earlier to stop that cascade of negativity. And what we found really interestingly, when we looked at the cartilage on MRI between the time of injury to two years and to five years, is that the group that had early surgery actually had more cartilage loss compared to the group that didn't have surgery. And you sort of ask, well, what might that be because? And I think I haven't had an ACL reconstruction and injury myself, but I know from colleagues and, and working clinically that the ACL surgery is, is almost a secondary trauma. Like you're going in there, you're drilling tunnels, you, you arthroscopically opening the joint, you come out of surgery having a very angry, hot, red, swollen knee, and so I think that whole cascade of inflammation can soften the cartilage, can create a knee that's not particularly happy. And then when you go and potentially, you know, put that knee through load, maybe going back to sport and whatnot, then that might actually 
be related to the development of osteoarthritis more so than if you don't have the, the reconstruction. And so we've actually done a little bit more work on the return to sport type of thing. And, and thankfully in a group with ACL reconstruction, it doesn't seem to increase the risk of osteoarthritis if you do go back to sport. So that doesn't seem to be the main thing. So that's a good thing for patients knowing that if you've had an injury, a reconstruction, you can go back to sport knowing that you're not going to put your knee at more risk. But it's probably more the, the, the inflammatory markers, the secondary trauma of that, um, that uh, reconstruction surgery that increases the risk even longer term as well. So I think um, what I always tell my patients is that you should always trial a, a non-operative um, period first. You can always go and have surgery later. And I think I always say, you need to prove to me that your knee is unstable. So some people can do really well without having surgery because their neuromuscular and muscle systems can compensate for that ruptured ACL and the mechanical instability. The, the neuromuscular system, the humans are very clever. They can really compensate quite well. And therefore you don't need the ACL if you're only going to perhaps not go back to that high level pivoting sport where you um, put your knee you know, at, at high stress a lot of the time then if you just want to run straight lines and play with your kids, then you're likely not needing to have the reconstruction. Um, if, for instance, you try a really intensive, progressive rehab strengthening program and you, you're starting to run or you're starting to get back into a bit of sport and you, your knee starts to become unstable at that point, at the level that you want to get back to, then that sort of probably instigates the conversation. Well, maybe your knee's actually not able to overcome the structural instability to the level of activity that you want to achieve, maybe let's have the discussion of, of a reconstruction as a potential option. But I always get them, you need to prove that your knee's unstable by going through this rehab and putting yourself through these activities um, that it's not gonna do well without surgery because we know that the outcomes are quite similar for the majority of people um, if you have early surgery or even delayed surgery. And doing a period of rehab irrespective of whether you go and have surgery or not, will be beneficial if you do go and have surgery. So that prehab, if you like. Um, so that's, I, I think it's, I, my take home is it's probably actually just educating the patient to empower them with the evidence because they're the ones ultimately that need to make the decision. And so presenting them with all the best available evidence and, and guiding them through the initial rehab stage, they often can change their mind. Um, that they need surgery once they realize they're actually doing quite well without it. And when you're uh, saying to the patient, let's do a trial for a non-operative phase so that you can prove to me that this knee is unstable, what kind of length of time are you talking about for that rehab process? And so, knowing, knowing that it's going to vary person to person, obviously, but in general. Of course, of course. So I think a period of two to three months is, is sufficient to provide um, an intensive um, strengthening program, let the knee settle down initially, and then actually start um, you know, within the first month and even two months, getting them to start really loading their knee. That's the thing, if you actually don't have surgery, your knee actually responds a lot quicker because you don't have any of the graft morbidity, you're not taking out some of the hamstring or the patella tendon. Um, there's no real reason why we need to be you know, conservative about, um, you know, uh, tearing a hamstring or, or whatever that might be because of the graft or re-rupturing the graft because you haven't had the graft um, reconstructed. So um, it's different for everyone because different people will respond differently, but actually, and there's no real hard and fast rule with this because you need to uh, rehab them to get them to a point where they're starting to do the activities that they want to get back to and at any point in that step ladder of increased physical activity demands that they might fail or start having, you know, severe um, uh, giving way episodes, then that's the point that you might have that conversation with someone. Mm -hmm. But if, if you're running and you start giving way and these people want to go back and play, you know, elite football, then clearly maybe not getting, being able to run without a, a stable knee you're probably not gonna be able to play football with a, with a stable knee. So then that might be the point where you revisit it. Mm -hmm. But if you're, you're running, no problems, and you try playing football and it starts giving way, but really you actually just wanna run, right? Playing football is just something you tried but didn't really wanna do, then you probably don't need um, 
the structural stability if you just want to run. So I, I, another thing I call, um, I like to say to patients is it's like a seatbelt, is that we all wear a seatbelt when we drive, but very rarely do we have a crash and we rely on that seatbelt to keep us safe. So if you're someone who walks around and might run, then the ACL is a bit like a seatbelt, is that you actually don't need that seatbelt on because you're not having a crash. You're not putting the knee through that real pivoting type movement to rely on it. So unless you're going to go back to a high level sport and you know, put your knee through those pivoting, jarring um, mechanisms of, of, of movement, then you probably don't need that seatbelt. You probably don't need that ACL to protect the knee. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> that's really great. And it sounds to me like when, if you're the clinician working with this patient during, let's say, this non-operative trial period where they have to prove again the instability, every single person is different. So what you're going to be looking at is different. Meaning, Correct. right? So if, if I just want to be able to play with my kids, I wasn't a runner before, I don't really need to run. I just want to ride a bike or, you know, you want to put people through the things that they want to be able to do. And that would kind of be the way you would test for that instability. But are you also using sort of standardized tests when it comes to uh, seeing if people have the stability in the knee? Exactly. Um, so it's really a goal-based discussion with mm -hmm. the patient. It, it come the, the the desires of, of the return to activity comes is driven by the patient. And as clinicians, you know, it's good to have that discussion to then work out, you know, what level do we need to get at. But certainly there's a number of standardized clinical tests uh, and really great patient reported outcomes that we can use with these patients. So um, the very common ones are the, the, the strength tests. So uh, if you have um, the resources, you know, a, a dynamometer, an isokinetic dynamometer in the clinic to look at the, the through range of quads and hamstring strength and um, meeting, you know, the criteria we typically use in the literature is meeting 90% of the strength compared to your uninjured side. Now, there's obviously some pros and cons about doing that. Um, and the other tests are typically hop tests. So single leg, hop as far as you can with a balanced landing, side to side hop tests. There's a number of different tests mm -hmm. we can use to try and assess the, the, the stability, the functional stability and, and confidence of the knee. Um, having said that though, we've actually just done some work uh, led by Brooke Patterson here as part of our team, looking at the limb symmetry index, which is the ACL reconstructed leg comparing to the uninjured leg. And what we found sort of between one and five years after their their reconstruction is that often the non-injured leg isn't that healthy gold standard because that often deteriorates because it's a period of inactivity mm -hmm. you might not be back playing the sport you're back to so that sort of decreases in capacity so it's not that reference standard that we should necessarily be comparing our reconstructed leg to right um, and so there's been a couple of other uh, bits and pieces that people have looked at alternatives to this type of measurement. And whether it's, if you have, see someone initially after injury, it's a, a great opportunity to, to start doing these tests is actually the estimated pre-injury capacity. So to estimate that it's best to try and do it as soon after injury as possible, given that patients might have some fear and confidence, you know, respect that obviously, but actually trying to do a hop test quite early before that other leg has the chance to mm -hmm. start decreasing in capacity because often the limb symmetry index overestimates what the reconstructed legs capacity actually is. And so they're the functional type of measures that I think we should be um, using in this patient population, not only to assess outcomes, but also patients get in my experience, really like seeing their improvements and getting feedback about how they're going along their journey. That's and very motivating. Totally. And an objective test of strength or a hop test, they can see right in front of their eyes how far they're hopping and if they're improving. And if they're not, then why not and have that conversation. And so that can be great for adherence, um, motivation, because this journey of a rehab, irrespective of whether you have a reconstruction or not, can be quite long and tedious. It can be boring. You're sitting there doing strength exercises, you know, any type of motivation to, to get people to continue um, is going to be beneficial. So 
Yeah, that's always one of the biggest complaints is, gosh, these exercises, when do we get to the X, Y, Z, you know, that you see on, on Instagram or on YouTube? And I'm like, you know, you're, you're <laughs> a month in, buddy. This is it. <laughs> exactly. And I think as physios and there's evidence suggests that, um, is that we're very good at doing the early stage um, of their rehab because patients are probably more compliant at that point as well. But there's evidence actually coming out of Australia that less than 5% of people who have had an ACL reconstruction, so less than 5%, actually go through a period of rehab beyond six months and Absolutely. include and return to sport type training. So I think whether it be a lack of understanding from a clinician standpoint or also that you know financial and motivational points of view from the patient after six months, they're like, I've had enough, I'm out, I'm good enough, I don't need that extra you know, icing on the cake to get back to sport. They tend to drop off and that's when not having that really high level agility um, capacity return to sport type training you increase the risk of of re-rupture and that obviously yeah. is a devastating impact for these patients and, and increases the risk of longer term negative outcomes as well yeah and i know here in the united states not so much in other parts of the world but insurance will oftentimes cut people off at three or four months okay so it's different everywhere <laughs> yeah so it's like okay so the person can walk and run and then yeah, then what do but... they do you know what i mean so um it, it kind of depends on on your your uh clinic model and things like that but i mean i've for been sure. lucky enough that i've been able to stay with my patients for 12 13 months and upwards so it's it's been really great to be there the week they are out of the or to getting them on mm. the field and actually doing things that are going to, you know, mimic their, their soccer, their football play. So, but it's, yeah, it's, it, there's so many obstacles, it seems. Totally. And I think there's some really great evidence coming from, from Scandinavia that for every month that you delay the return to sport, up to nine months, it actually reduces your re-injury risk by 50%. Mm -hmm. That's, that's mind-blowing for me. So it, it not only, you know, is it from a, um, you know, a rehab point of view, but actually from a, a re-injury point of view, having that nine months will actually, um, you know, reduce your risk substantially of re-rupturing when you do go back to sport. And I think that is weighs so heavily on people's minds when they're first going back to sport. Um, that fear, that's a huge um, impact psychologically for these types of patients. And I think um, often an ACL injury can happen so innocuously, like you've done this movement a thousand times at training before. So why this time? And it's that, that fear of, or oh, it wasn't a major blow when I first did it. Like it wasn't someone running across and, you know, really hitting my knee. It was, I was on my own. And so what's stopping that from happening again? And yeah. that's when that, I think that feeds into the fear of what oh, could happen anytime again. Yeah. Uh, so I think I often try and say to patients, well, you injured your ACL initially, let's get your knee back to better than it was before you injured it to yeah. prevent it from happening again. Because once we know, once you have one injury, the biggest risk factor, so the biggest risk factor for a second injury is having a first injury. So. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> and I've quoted that, uh, that study of the nine months uh, reducing 50%, especially when you're working with kids who think, I'm fine now, I can walk in. I was like, listen, this, and you have to have that conversation with the child and with the parents. And once the yeah. parents hear that, they're like, okay. Like we get it. Yeah. Even though her physician was on board, like you're not playing until you're one year out from surgery. I mean, everybody was on the same page, but it's hard to keep, um, it's, it's hard to keep everyone on the same page, but being able to use the literature and say, listen, I'll send you the study. Here it is. Yeah. You really and need to see actually this. Pulling, it's actually, for some people, it's not um, in needing to encourage them. It's actually needing them to pull them back. Yeah, so that, exactly. That's where your education and, and clinical reasoning and discussions with patients will differ quite a bit is that some people are so gung ho in their rehab and they just want to get back to sport. They're too keen. You actually have to, as I said, pull them back. Whereas the opposite might be true for some other people. So uh, it's really interesting that, that how different people respond differently to, to this type of um, quite devastating injury. Right. And how they respond, how you can use, like you mentioned the study of Scandinavia, how you can use that study with both of those extremes of people. 
right? Yep. So the people who are afraid and the people who are gung ho. So uh, again, it's it's having this good rapport with your patient and their their st- other stakeholders uh, to to kind of get them through safely through their rehab. But now we talked about it earlier on, and that's osteoarthritis. So fifty percent of people will develop some sort of osteoarthritic art. Oh my God, I can't even speak. Osteoarthritic changes in their knee. So what do we do about that? How, how, is there a way to, pre- are there prevention strategies? What can we do? And on that note, we'll take a quick break to hear from our sponsor and be right back with Adam's answer. This episode is brought to you by NetHealth, helping you maintain strong relationships with your patients. The Redoc Patient Portal provides a secure line of communication between you and your patients. Conduct virtual visits and have follow-up conversations with your patients via secure messaging when it's convenient for you. Patients have 24-7 secure, on-demand access to their therapy health information without phone calls and voice messages. Video conferencing for telehealth, secure messaging, share documents and photos, and view health information and appointments. To learn more, contact them at redoc at nethealth.com. So this is something that we've been looking at um, for a few years now, and obviously, um, you know, we'd love to be able to have a treatment to to stop this from happening, but we're not actually there yet. The, the, there's a lot of really nice longitudinal studies investigating risk factors for, for the increased um, prevalence of osteoarthritis in this population. And there's a number of risk factors that we can start informing how we might treat these people initially as well. So the number one risk factor is having a combined injury with a meniscus tear or a cartilage lesion. So if you have not only an ACL injury, and very rarely is it just an ACL injury, it can often be combined with a meniscus tear, cartilage lesion, bone marrow lesion, et cetera. So that more severe sort of type of injury will um, automatically put you at risk longer term of having osteoarthritis. That's not that exciting because as clinicians, we can't do much about that. Um, it's, it's not really modifiable. So we've been really trying to, to identify some some factors that might be modifiable that we can address. So things like BMI, um, being overweight, we know increases the risk of osteoarthritis longer term, um, not only after injury, but in people of older age who have um, the atraumatic type of osteoarthritis. But what's coming, emerging from the literature more and more is the, is the quadriceps weakness. So quadriceps in particular, um, the muscle weakness in that, in that muscle, and also the functional impairment. So we talked about hot tests um, and you know, balance and neuromuscular control a little bit earlier. So they're actually starting to become more and more prominent as risk factors for the medium and long-term outcomes for osteoarthritis. So we've just published a paper in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, which looked at this exact question. So do functional um, outcomes, so typical tests we might use to clear someone to return to sports, so hot tests and strength tests. Do these actually have a relationship with future osteoarthritis? <clears throat> and what we found, so this is at one year we tested them, and then at five years we measured their osteoarthritis on MRI, so quite um, sensitive measure of osteoarthritis, but also on X-ray. And what we found is that we combine a lot of these tests together and into a test battery, so side-to-side hop test, single leg forward hop test. If you have a poor outcome at one year in these tests, then you're more likely to develop osteoarthritis at five, five years down the track. And so there's other studies that show quite similar findings in this space as well, which is really, I mean, it's upsetting because um, they're more at risk of osteoarthritis, but it's quite encouraging as, as clinicians as we can, this is our forte, we can actually do something about it in the initial stages of rehab. And again, this can be a great education and motivational tool to say, on this test, you're not achieving at a level that you need to achieve. This is not only going to put you at risk of re-injury, the research shows that this is actually going to increase your risk of developing arthritis later on. And we need to be a little bit careful about how we inform our patients about this, because as I said, some people can be really fearful and, and, and terrified about re-injuring and, and worried about what their knee is going to look like. And so presenting them with, well, you're going to, be a, you're going to have arthritis in 10 years as well, might not be the, quite the right move to allay that fear at that point in that patient. Whereas other people um, 
having and knowing that information can be really motivating to try and get the knee back to the best possible um, condition that it can be. So again, it's very personalized how we educate our patients, but I think it's really important to educate them along the journey about that increased risk of OA. And, and encouragingly, there's some, some really um, positive signs that we might start to be, um, be able to modify that risk with some really great rehab, getting back to the strength getting back to improving function um, in our clinical work as well. So I think that's really, really exciting moving forward. And that's great news for physical therapists because this is, our, this is where we live. So, wow, can we can really make a difference in someone's life um, by good comprehensive rehab within that first year after ACL injury. And again, that's regardless of whether they have surgery or not. Is that correct? Exactly. Okay. Yep, exactly. And and as I said earlier about the return to sport, so we've also done um, some research, which should be published shortly, hopefully, looking at the fact that um, again, encouragingly, if you have an ACL injury or reconstruction, and then decide to go back to these pivoting type sports, some people say, "Oh, you shouldn't go back to that." You know, the the high impact sport because that's going to put your knee at undue stress, and you're going to have more arthritis longer term. Is that what we've found? Is actually that's not the case. So we can, we can be confident that we can give these people, um, you know, the advice to go back to sport if that's what they really want to for their quality of life and mental health. They derive a lot of social pleasure from playing sport. The good thing is, is if you have a great functional and strong knee, then that's not going to put your knee at further risk by going back to sport. Sure, it's going to perhaps increase your risk of re-injury compared to sitting on the couch at home. <laughs> but we know that from a lot of mental health and also physical health, being physically active and involved in sport has so many more benefits um, to our general health as well. Absolutely. And now, can we, if you don't mind, talk about the patient that I think a lot of physiotherapists are going to see, and it's like the patient that you saw 15, 20 years after their ACL. So we're not, we're not seeing them one to five years, but now we're seeing them 10 to 15 to 20 years later. That's when a lot of people are going to come to us with knee pain. So what can we do for these patients? Is there, do we want to look at these uh, hot tests in these patients? Can, does that make a difference? What happens then? Because that's a big bulk of our population. Yeah, you're exactly right. And it varies about, again, what their goals are. But often, if they're 10 to 20 years down the track and they've got osteoarthritis, we can look to the, the literature in the osteoarthritis field. And in that space, it's very, very compelling evidence that exercise therapy and education provides the strongest effect for pain and symptoms and function in this population. And so that's almost reassuring that it's quite similar to what we're seeing in the early post-operative or post-injury stage is that whatever level on the spectrum you are post-injury and the development of osteoarthritis, essentially your treatment's going to be quite similar where you're developing the strength that underlies everything that we do in day-to-day -day activities and indeed if we want to get back to sport and also the functional capacity. So ask for the, what they want to do, what they can't do, because of their pain and symptoms and make it a really goal oriented um, treatment. And I think it's really important to also ask them what physical therapy have they actually done? A mm -hmm. lot of these people come to us and they've seen five different surgeons and they've got different opinions. And when you actually question them and interrogate them, they've actually never had a gym program or they've never done any strength training. And it's like, well, of course you <laughs> have a few problems. So let's start you from the very basics. Um, and, and not, you know, not flare them up by going too hard too fast, but actually educate them around the importance of strength and functional control, um, that the knee will benefit a lot from that, um, as well as from a function symptomatic point of view, and, and, and start building on their strength capacity and functional capacity to be able to meet whatever goal that they want um, to get back to. So I don't see it as being a totally you know, separate patient from the, the post-injury one to the, to the OA one. It's on a spectrum. And a lot of the treatment's going to be very similar in principle, um, depending on what their goals. And their goals might change over time. So the treatment course, might yeah. be different as well. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. That's great. Now, can we talk about the study that you are currently undertaking at La Trobe? Uh, University in Melbourne, the uh, the super knee. So, can you tell us a little bit more about that? What is it, and what are your goals for it? 
we're super excited, pardon the pun, for the <laughs> knee. Um, so this is a, a project that's really um, stemmed from over the last 10 years of our work, um, looking at identifying these risk factors, as I've talked about earlier, to then be able to um, get some funding. So we've got some funding from the Australian Government um, Health and Medical Research Council to perform this really world first randomized controlled trial to see if we can actually prevent early osteoarthritis and improve symptoms and function through an exercise therapy intervention. So in essence, we're gonna get a whole lot of people, about 200 people who are about one or two years following their ACL reconstruction. So they've had that initial period of, of rehab to get better, because some people do really well. We need to remember that, that some people do great following their injury and surgery, and they don't need um, more intervention longer term. So we wanna try and capture the ones that have some ongoing symptoms and functional impairments, haven't got back to doing what they want to do at one year post-op, two years post-op, at a point where they should be able to, to do those things. And because they're going in our, um, our, based on the research that suggests those people are more at risk of developing longer term problems. So we want to capture those at high risk and we're going to separate them into two different groups in our clinical trial. One group will get a, a really intensive physio therapist led exercise therapy program. So a lot of strengthening based stuff, agility, neuromuscular control, education around physical activity, um, you know, uh, loading of the knee, return to sport. And then that's over a period of four months initially. And then the other group gets um, what we're trying to say is usual care. So very little intervention. They get a little bit of education and then some booklets with the types of exercises they could do if they want to, essentially, which is what they'd probably get from their GP or their surgeon similarly. And we're going to then assess the, um, their knees and their general health and symptoms and function from baseline and their changes over four months. And then also look at the changes up to 18 months as well, because the MRI is, our, is one of our main outcomes, looking at early cartilage changes, which is our OA osteoarthritis marker. And some of these can take a little while to, um, to show up. So if you have a, an MRI on one day and then go and have an MRI the next week, chances are you're probably not going to see much difference. Yeah. So we need that period of you know 12 to 18 months to be able to see an effect of our exercise therapy intervention. Um, whereas the symptoms and function we're expecting to be able to improve quite a bit within the first four months, which is going to be the most intensive period. And so, yeah, our hypothesis is that this really strong, intensive, progressive rehab program, strengthening, getting these knees back to better than what they were before is going to be beneficial for their symptoms, function, general health, quality of life, but also hopefully be able to show that it's actually either preventing the early changes we see on MRI or indeed maybe slowing the changes. So we know that cartilage thickness um, decreases. So we have a loss of cartilage. Bone marrow lesions can start developing. Osteoph small osteophytes and bony spurs can start developing over a course of one or two years. And so we want to see if there's a difference in, in the development of those features in the two different groups. So we, we are ready to, to hit, hit go on this study. It's been a little bit delayed with, with COVID um, mm -hmm. affecting us at the moment as well. So we're really excited to, to get going on this study and hopefully be a really impactful um, research project moving the field forward and empowering clinicians to say we actually can make a difference um, in this space for these patients. Yeah, I love it. Well, I look forward to uh when you guys can actually get started and uh maybe 12 to 18 months from then so it sounds like a great study and like you said it's something that's can be so empowering for physical therapists or physiotherapists to then pass on to their patients and kind of transfer that power from the from the physio to the patient to give them a greater sense of well-being, which is exactly that's what we do, right? That's why that's why we became PTs um, <laughs> or physios. So uh, before we sign off, just have a couple other things. Number one, what uh, what are your biggest sort of takeaway messages for the listeners? So I think the biggest thing is probably when you first see the patient who've had an acute ACL injury in front of you and they're devastated, they often might come into your rooms and have heard, particularly here in Australia, our media is very 
you know, centric on if you've had an injury, you need reconstruction because the elite athletes tend to have the reconstruction and I want the best treatment and therefore I need a reconstruction is actually having a conversation with them and saying, presenting them with the evidence as I spoke about earlier. And there's, there's no problem trialing a period of non-operative management for a couple of months, because that's going to be a great help if you do go down and have surgery afterwards. And it's, I think the reality is that a lot of people given the opportunity to do some non-operative rehab actually can change their mind over the course. And they realize actually my knee's going really well. I actually don't need to have surgery where I, as I thought I would. So that's um, instead of just going gung ho into, into surgery, I think the evidence is very clear that a period of non-operative management is beneficial for most patients, almost all. And then the second um, key take home for me is is during a uh, post-operative or post-injury rehabilitation is actually working these patients um, intensively and progressively. I think uh, we tend to shine on the, on, the, on the side of being a little bit cautious, particularly after they've had a reconstruction, we worry about the graft re-rupturing. And of course we have to respect the surgeon's requests of, of what we need to do with the patient from a restriction standpoint. But I think there's there's a evidence growing now that we can be a lot more intensive early on um, and progressive with our exercises and and looking to the strength and conditioning research. Like these guys um, are trained specifically to develop strength and conditioning programs, and I think as physios we're we're pretty good at it. Some better than others, and I think meeting the American College of Sports Medicine you know criteria for strength gains is actually you need to work really hard. You need to get sweaty, you need to actually, you know, be working at an intense level. And so unless we put our patients through that, those sort of levels of intensity, we're not going to see the best outcomes that these patients can, then can achieve. So they're my two take homes is I think try a non-operative period of, of rehab initially and revisit that along the course of the program. And then don't be afraid to actually build a lot of strength in these people, because that's going to be beneficial for their short term, prevent re-injury, and the long term of preventing arthritis likely down the track as well. Awesome. And then number two, next next question is, and it's something I ask everyone, knowing where you are now in your life and in your career, what advice would you give to yourself right out of uh, physiotherapy school? Oh, good question. Um, I'd say don't worry so much. <laughs> things, things will work out. Um, I think in the research, I'll probably have a, my research hat on a little bit is, is often clinicians who want to start in research or even researchers who want to continue in research is that the funding can be really, um, you know, tricky and really competitive and can often make and break careers. But I think um, some general, you know, I'd tell myself is don't worry too much about that. Just, link up with um, good people and strong mentors. And I think finding, I'm sure you've had other guests <laughs> say this as well, but finding, finding good people who, who can mentor you really well and put your interests um, or your goals in your career sort of forward to their collaborators so you can meet new people and open doors. I think um, I was always worried that there wasn't going to be enough doors opening, but I've been really lucky in my career that I've been surrounded by a great team um, throughout and doors have inevitably, um, even if I don't expect them to keep opening. And so having the, being in the right place at the right time is important, but you can, you can help to um, create more instances of being in the right place and, and more instances of being in the right time by putting yourself um, out there and, and meeting new people and, and surrounding yourself with really good mentors. Great advice. And number three, last question, where can people find you? People can find me in my lounge room at the moment. I'm locked up. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, so I am uh, have a Twitter account, at AG Colvener. My profile's on the Latrobe um, Sport and Exercise Medicine Research Centre page at Latrobe University. So we have a blog um, at our research centre with a lot of really nice, um, impactful um, easy to digest, short blogs, short videos, infographics designed for clinicians, designed for patients. So you can take them off the blog and give them to your patients. So I cannot recommend that resource highly enough. Um, 
and then my email, feel free to email me. Um, you can find that email address on the Latrobe, um, on my Latrobe website page as well. So very happy Perfect. to provide. And, and we'll have all the links to that at uh, the show notes on, uh, for this podcast over at podcast.healthywealthysmart.com. So we'll have a link to your Twitter and to your page at Latrobe and also to the blog. So if people want to get those resources, they can. And we'll also Fantastic. put in links to the, to the papers that we spoke about today so that people can go and kind of read those papers as well. So we can link up to all of that. So Adam, thank you so much. It was a great conversation. I appreciate your time. It's been fantastic. Thanks, Karen. You're welcome. And everyone, thanks so much for listening. Have a great couple of days and stay healthy, wealthy, and smart. Thank you to Adam. And of course, thank you to our sponsor for today's episode, NetHealth. Again, NetHealth has created the Redoc Patient Portal, which provides a secure line of communication between you and your patients. You can conduct virtual visits and have follow-up conversations with your patients via secure messaging when it's convenient for you. Patients have 24-7 secure on-demand access to their therapy health information without phone calls and voice messages. To learn more, contact NetHealth at redoc at nethealth.com. Thank you for listening and please subscribe to the podcast at podcast.healthywealthysmart.com. And don't forget to follow us on social media.